Welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast with Scott McKenzie. Scott is a passionate industry professional dedicated to transferring cutting-edge, industry-focused innovations and trends while highlighting the men and women who keep the world moving. So put on your hard hat, grab your work boots, and let's go. Uh, Yes, you have. Yes, you have joined the Industrial Talk Podcast. This is where we celebrate you industry heroes. That's you, pointing to you. And we celebrate you because you are bold and you are brave. You dare greatly. You you solve problems, which we need to do, especially today. You're you're changing lives and you're changing the world as we speak right this very moment. And thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much for joining. All right, in the hot seat, we got a gentleman by the name of Colin Duncan, and uh, he is the CEO at Seam Group. And you know what we're going to be talking about? No, we're we're going to be talking about reliability. We're going to be talking about safety. And we're going to be talking about maintenance and how they all sort of interrelate to each other. Very cool conversation. Colin is great. Without a doubt, he's great. Let's get cracking. Okay, I I know. I know. I love geeking out on this stuff. I I just think that, that because of where we are today within industry and who we have out there, who are just really innovating. Uh, it, it is more, more important than ever. As I, you know, shoot, how many, how many interviews have I done of industry leaders? Uh, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. A million? But the reality is, is that each one of those leaders, each one of those uh, innovative, uh, push-the-envelope, trailblazing uh, industry leaders uh, get down to this. They're always educating. Yep. Because the world is changing that fast. Always educating. Looking to collaborate. Which is one of the biggest themes that I get every time when I have these conversations. Is their desire to collaborate with individuals, the companies, the people, the whatever it might be. To collaborate in such a way to solve problems, right? And I, again, harp on or go back to the fact that, one, we can't be doing this alone we have to be collaborating we have to find companies that want to collaborate and we want to have companies that get stuff done and you want to work with those individuals you want to work with those companies and the 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 bottom line is that you're driving to innovation right you're just constantly driving to innovation you're never ever satisfied with the status quo you are innovationists And that's what makes industry so spectacular is because we're always educating, we're always collaborating, and we're always innovating to solve the world's problems, to deliver products more efficiently, to to develop a product that uh, meets a specific needs. And it's global, right? It's global. That's the kind of club that you belong to, you industry hero. Love it. All right. Now that I've just got done uh, preaching, let's get on with the interview itself. Now, again, I mean, Colin is, is I mean, the, the, the wonderful team at uh, Seam Group, they, they get it and they just see it. And they just, they're, they're driven to be able to, to look at safety and reliability and maintenance and pulling it all together because they are just like we are in industry, just like we are with uh, collaborating, we th- it's bound together. There are ties with those incredible solutions. And to just sort of leave one as a standalone doesn't give the whole picture. It's not that holistic look at how you keep people safe, how you keep that asset up and running, which is, well, it is. You know, putting more money on the bottom line. And how do you do it with, with a sense of uh, focus and having your, your dollars spent properly, right? Again, we're going to be talking about this triad. Safety, reliability, maintenance. And you can't. I mean, and it, it, it can apply to everything. It can apply to anything. So it's really, really important. Great conversation. All right. You can tell I'm, I'm a big fan of Seam Group. 
I'm a big fan of anybody that is, and any company that is willing to do what they do, educate, collaborate, and uh, innovate. I'm a big fan of anybody that does that. Enjoy the interview with Colin. Colin, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast. It is a great honor to, that you just going to share your wisdom and insights with all the listeners at Industrial Talk. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, Scott. I'm very all well. the way from California, and I'm jealous. That's probably a great, gorgeous day, right? All the way from California, and the accent suggests that too, doesn't it? So. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, uh, that the other side of the street of California, whatever that is, that's where you're exactly. from. All right, for the listeners out there, let's get uh, a little level set and uh, give us a little background on who Colin is. Nothing big, nothing fancy, just who you are. And then we're going to dive into a great topic that I'm pretty passionate about. Yeah, no, sure. Absolutely. I mean, the the short version is, um, as you can probably tell, I'm British. I have been in the U.S. now 17 years, um, proudly a citizen since 2016. Get out of here. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I would say, to folks, I've got a foot in both camp, I guess, still. So, uh, yeah, you know, you're, dual, yeah, right. you're dual citizen? Dual citizenship? Uh, yeah, no, technically. Yeah. So, um, no, so, my previous business, I mean, you know, the short version is my previous business was a safety consulting firm that I suspect a lot of folks will know uh, BST, uh, very strong in the safety, leadership, safety culture space. Um, ran that business for uh, close to a decade. Um, I actually sold it to a German testing and inspection business called Decra. Um, left there 2016, been involved in safety uh, boards of a number of safety companies, um, some of which you'll know. Um, and actually, interestingly, during that period, um, did some work with a friend of mine, uh, David Michaels. Dr. Michaels was the head of OSHA under oh, the yeah. Obama administration, longest serving head of OSHA. We actually looked at setting up a, um, a, a research unit at George Washington University. When David left uh, his OSHA post, he went back to his professorial role at GW. Um, and that, that the research unit was primarily focused on um, studying the relationship between pr- production or productivity and safety. Because both I in my role as CEO of BST and, and DECRA, um, and David in his role at OSHA, we, we'd seen this abundance of anecdotal evidence that companies who were safe tended to get other good things to happen. See, I, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt real quick because that is not the uh, uh, the thinking out there. And the reason is, is that they think that you can't be productive and safe. One has to be more or less. And, and that's an interesting observation or, or study. Well, and, and there are actually, I mean, you know, this is for a, maybe another discussion, but there are quite a number of interesting uh, studies in the in, in the academic literature looking at the relationship between you know, pr- productivity and performance outcomes in manufacturing environments and safety. And, and the short version is if you go after safety, you can often drive other performance outcomes in production environments. The converse does not hold true. Right. That's interesting. So, huh. see, but then oh, just, really? and just to finish the picture in terms of my yeah, background, yeah. joined Scene Group um, uh, in the fall of 2019 uh, in the role of CEO. And, um, you know, we are in the process of really putting together an integrated approach to safety, reliability, and maintenance. Which, you know, why did I take this role? Why am I so passionate about I was about getting it? ready to ask. I was just like, and why? <laughs> You're kind of joining the dots here, right, Scott? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> making it easy. Um, you know, I, I was kind of had some real passion about this. You know, my experience leading a safety consulting group globally, my experience, um, and, you know, talking to um, you know, David Michaels, the where we can connect the dots in production, manufacturing, distribution environments between safety, reliability, and maintenance, all three of those boats rise with the tide. There is, there is a, a, a collective benefit. And I frankly weary somewhat of the narrative one will often hear on the shop floor of, well, they put produ- you know, production is more important than safety. I, my experience is that when you talk at the executive level, it, it's not a case of we want one or the other. We want both. The challenge is how do we get there? 
Right. And that's the answer, frankly, that at Scene Group we're trying, to, we're trying to solve. How do we partner with our clients to bring those disciplines together so that you get collective efficiency across all three? Yeah, because today, maybe, you know, maybe I'm dating myself, but uh, in the past, these were silos, right? Uh, production did production stuff. Uh, uh, or well, let's just say operations did operation stuff. Maintenance did maintenance stuff. Uh, reliability was just a buzzword and safety was just to keep you out of trouble to a certain extent. But really, really is that operations sort of ran the thing because that's where the money was made. Maintenance was always the, uh, the you know, problem child to a certain extent because they were spending capital and, and costing money. And everybody's like, hey, heard about this reliability conversation. And then safety was just because we had to have one because somebody said we did. And that's the way that was the culture. Just keep it rolling. I, I, I think one can see that culture, but I think what you will find is organizations with you know, more sophisticated understanding of their operations understand that it's a system. All of the pieces interact. Yeah. If you, if you look at things that happen when you have unplanned downtime, well, one of the things we know with unplanned downtime is that that tends to cause your maintenance costs to be higher. Things take longer to fix. You're rushing inventory. You're trying to norm normalize your operations afterwards tends to be longer. But, but what about unplanned downtime from a safety point of view? We know the, the footprint in incidents that take place, what, you know, no matter how serious they are, but particularly more serious ones, you tend to find the footprint of unplanned maintenance. Unplanned downtime where people are trying to get the line back up and running, the work isn't properly planned beforehand, people are rushing, they're doing you know, pre-task risk assessments on the hoof, they're trying to figure out how to get everything back up, and in the process, people get hurt. So there is a symbiosis that I think everybody actually understands is there. It's just a case of not being reactive and being proactive across all three disciplines, right? So as I look at this, and I think you guys uh, at uh, Seam call it the triad, right? And so we're looking at a triangle. We're looking at safety. We're looking at reliability. And we're looking at uh, maintenance and having that triad sort of harmoniously work together companies and, and help me through this is that we naturally say what's higher in priority. We just prioritize naturally. So I always say safety is number one. And then, and then of course, reliability. And it, it, it just, you just naturally go there. How do you take a company that has this existing culture and begin to roll it out? Is there an incremental way of being able to do that? I th there are multiple facets to how you get the culture aligned. I think, right. you know, step number one is making sure there are clarity around the goals and objectives of the different stakeholders. You know, before one starts to work quotes on culture, you better understand that the outcomes are outcomes that everybody shares. Um, so I, I think that's step number one. I think step number two, you, you referenced silos earlier, yeah. is, is recognizing and valuing the expertise and talent that exists in the different silos, operating disciplines, whatever you want to call it, and finding a way of having your, your professional groupings share that expertise and, and value it collectively. You know, it's, it's interesting to me, whether it's a maintenance, reliability, or safety, we've got really robust what, you know, methodologies developed over the last three or four decades to allow us to maximize the uptime and performance of our production environment. But we've also developed very rigorous disciplines from a, a hazard identification risk management point of view for safety. Surely we're all better served if, if the folks who are working across those disciplines understand what sits within the disciplines and can leverage off of each other. Because it is a system. You know, the reality is we can't run 
any production environment without human beings. So if we don't understand the factors yeah. that determine whether or not human beings operate in reliable ways in the context of the, uh, you know, the, the engineering, the plant that we're working with, we're going to run into problems. So it, it, it's, we had this conversation offline and we were talking a lot about uh, uh, people and culture. And, and you brought up a good point in your, your, your points here. One, uh, I think it's imperative and correct me if I'm wrong, imperative that you get those stakeholders all shaking their head saying, yeah, this is important. Yeah, we've got to do that. Because naturally, once it starts to go down into your operations, there, then if, if the clarity is not there, then again, people and culture, it'll start to begin being suboptimal for lack of a better term, because there's no clarity, nobody's shaking their heads. And that's where it always resides it's got to be there it, it, it has to be there and i think this comes to you know forgive me for you know sound like a scratched record here i'm talking about no. you know the management system but the, the system that you operate if you look at um exxon mobile post valdez you know what, what did exxon realize they had to do they had to you know really bake safety operational reliability into everything they did so Exxon have, and you know, it's publicly available, the Operational Integrity Management System, OEMS. And it's, it, it is about reliable operations. That it, it's not a safety system. Mm -hmm. It's about running your, mm -hmm. your, your business reliably. And I, you know, I think some of the more sophisticated sectors have learned from industries for whom reliability was non-negotiable. The nuclear industry, uh, oh. you know, the airline industry. The airline industry. Don't, <laughs> please don't come to me and say, yeah, by the way, I just got this secondhand dog on, you know, widget over here and it's not hanging off the wing. No, yeah. nobody wants to do that. Although as a brief aside, am I the only person who's thinking right now, oh, yeah, I'm going to start traveling soon because I'm getting vaccinated this week. Oh, we'll get in an airplane. Well, wait a minute. That airplane has been sat in the desert for the year, a year and a half. I, I don't know. Am I the only person who's a little no, bit you're not. No, no, <laughs> you're not at all because I had the same question. I said, look at that. Uh, I mean, in fact, I, you guys are out of Cleveland, uh, buzzed up on Cleveland. You've got a lot of continental airplanes just sort of sitting there. They got the little, you know, cowlings. They're just sitting up there, right? And I, right. all I could think about is that they're sitting. Is somebody going to be doing the, the, the uh, uh, maintenance? I feel a bit more comfortable. I drove through the Mojave um, tail end of last year. There's a bunch of them sat out in the desert there. I'm, I'm more comfortable getting on those because the climate won't have done quite as much harm to them. But anyway, we're getting off track. Yeah, but, but I, I, high reliability industries learn things about how you, you have to understand the interaction between your, your management system, your engineering and processes, and your people and that reliability is something you engineer across all three. It's not something that sits separately from the others. Um, and, and that for me is, you know, trickling down the learning from these high reliability industries to industry more broadly, I think is something we can be doing here. And, and part of that is if you if you you know if you if you have had exposure in the nuclear industry, you'll find that the technical professionals do share the technical skill set that they have and, and, and frankly value the respective skill set that they bring. You know, safe, safety in the nuclear industry isn't something that sits in a separate, you know, port of government. No. Like, um, Let me ask you this, and, and, and it's along the same lines. And and some of the pushback, of course, is is added cost. Now I'm I manufacture this chemical and I compete with this chemical company and I'm doing all of this stuff. And if I deploy a system like <laughs> in a nuclear facility or plane, it just adds cost. And, and so that, that might be a flawed viewpoint of it, but the reality is now I can't compete with this over here because I'm trying to be responsible over here. And, you know, the, the, it's nice to think that way. I, I can share with you some anecdotes, but I think there's also, I'll go back to some of the academic studies that I've come across. Yeah. There's plenty to show that, you know, when you actually study these relationships, you find that organizations that invest in a systemic approach to these three disciplines, 
get outcomes across all three. And what we have to bear in mind is that if we get outcomes across all three, we are definitively reducing our cost that makes us more competitive. It's actually the siloed mentality that increases the cost. The in integrative approach is the one that eliminates cost. And I, you know, I'll tell you, I remember working with an uh, aluminium uh, uh, um, smelting um, um, rolling operation globally. This was a, an organization a lot of folks will know um, with a couple of hundred um, facilities across the globe. And, uh, you know, I remember them moving a plant manager to a site in China that um, when that individual was moved was the worst performing site globally on any of their production scorecard metrics. The individual who was moved there um, determined that focus number one was going to be improving safety of the, of the plant. Um, you know, they'd had a, a pretty torrid record from a safety point of view. Over the next two and a half years, that plant, plant went from the bottom on their production scorecard to their top decile. Wow. And, to that plant manager, and, man. and, did, and did it using, and it's, it, you know, it, it can sound cliched, but did it kind of using safety as a bit of a Trojan horse for what was about engagement, alignment, culture change, focus, priorities, communication, all the things that make an operation run smoothly. Um, and, and, you know, th this is me revealing my bias and my safety background, but you will generally find the great thing about safety is that people won't argue with the inherent value of the outcome. We don't want, we don't want people to get hurt when they come to work. We want them to go home in the same physical condition they came here in. It's a pretty, it's a relatively easy coalescing agent. You know? So, uh, a thought comes to mind. I, I put my my plant manager hat on, and I like what you're saying. I hear you, and it's great. Uh, how, how long does some type of thing like this generally take to begin to change that culture, to begin to deploy what is necessary, and then create a sustainable uh, process going forward? Okay. You know, the... the, uh, the Don't say 18 months. If you say 18 months, so help me God, I'll, I'll come and reach through that Zoom. I was going to equivocate far more than 18 months. Yeah, I, thank you know, you. The British would say, how long is a piece of string, which I, I know doesn't always translate here. But <laughs> I, I mean, look, it, it depends where you're starting from, yeah. right? And it depends what... It depends really on how intractable some of the problems are going to be. But, you know... How long it takes should not be a determinant of whether or not it's the right thing to do. Um, You're right about that. And I You're think right. the, the, the other thing I would say is, you know, we, we talk about culture very loosely, but it's, it's maybe better to focus on, you know, shifting the dial in terms of kind of the climate in the near term. And, and again, this is something that's been written about more on the safety side of things, but understanding that, you know, culture is big and amorphous and en engineers – tend to run the environments we're working in. And engineers don't like things that are amorphous and kind of, you know, part of kind of get, but, but there are things you can measure real time in terms of participation, alignment, uh, collaboration. Uh, you know, these, these are things we can see happening. We can set near term goals for the outcomes we're trying to deliver in three months, in six months, and I don't want to say, you know, worry about the long-term culture change stuff later. Let's actually focus on the things we can get traction on near term. And particularly, let's focus on the metrics that will tell us we're making progress towards the goal. Uh, do, do, you, do you find, and, and it, I know this is it's going to be hard to answer to a certain extent, do you find greater uh, adoption of this triad process if you're capturing a business up front hey we've got the capital we're going to be uh planning it we're going to be able to uh you know run through what we want to and have our scheduled maintenance and think or not scheduled sorry plan maintenance all of that stuff do you find it easier in a more greenfield type environment 
It's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think one might argue that in a greenfield environment, necessarily safety is going to uh, sort of come to the fore simply by virtue of, you know, the, the nature of the construction and commissioning process. You'll, you know, you'll have heightened awareness. Um, you know, the converse of that is that uh, one might often find that reliability and maintenance considerations that can have an impact on safety perhaps don't get enough attention when the site is yeah. still greenfield. Yeah. Um, and again, that comes back to, you know, systems thinking. You know, I remember a, uh, a client we worked with in my old business who had a, a failure at one of their facilities uh, in South Africa. Uh, you know, and, and the short version is the inherent design problem was, uh, you know, created in the handoff between, you know, design and operations. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think we'll, we'll see a fo footprint of that quite commonly. Yeah. So I think the answer is, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. But, but, but in reality, we want to keep everybody calibrated on it's not a case of what's easier or what's harder. It's a case of what's the right way of managing the system. See, and that's that's an interesting uh, point because I, I think it has its own challenges, right? It just does, you know. And I I know that I've been in an environment where you're you're commissioning the asset first, you're building it, then you're trying to commission it, and everybody's just looking at the money, and the money is like, hey, 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 let's get going, let's get this thing spinning, and and there 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 is a tendency sometimes is to cut corners, you to not align that pump properly or whatever it might be. And then you find a, so yeah, I think there's a, there's a rash of other things. Well, at, and at the simplest level, you know, I was looking at um, one of our teams sent me some images just last week of a, a facility where they, you know, the client had had a, a, a near miss that you know, could have been relatively serious for the individual involved. And simply looking at the, um, you know, this was a, a, around a, a fire suppression system. You looked at the design of the equipment in the room, and for somebody to access one of the shutoffs, they would have had to crawl around energized equipment in a space that was about the size that, I don't know, maybe my 18-year-old daughter could squeeze in there. But, <laughs> and, and, and how often do we see that, right? That You know, the, the folks who are you know, really doing that design and that they're not, they're not thinking through some of the operating factors that we, we then see in the operating environment a year, two years, three years down the track. See, that's, yeah. that's really important. Hey, uh, one last question, uh, yeah. roadblocks. This is all great. This uh, uh, listeners, I'm just telling you, this is so important. And I like where this is going, where they're truly committed to first safety, that triad safety, Maintenance, reliability, safety, reliability, maintenance, whatever it is, I like that. And I think that it cannot be separated. I like that. But then there's always roadblocks. What are these roadblocks? Well, I mean, I think the first roadblock is we need um, operational executives to, I think, dig in a little bit to understand the methodology and technical discipline that their, that their professionals are using. Yeah, not and not skim over the surface. Um, you know, I think we need them. We need collectively to understand that the things that cause failure in reliability, maintenance, and safety often have c common pathways. Yeah, and understand that you know the discipline of understanding where the failure might occur evaluating risk and consequence and the and the modeling that we do across those disciplines is actually pretty common and that as we pull them together we will kind of rapidly see the efficiency so i think that the roadblock is primarily around aligning the thinking and and creating some level of intellectual curiosity <laughs> I'm always down to, I'm, I'm always down with uh, 
Educate more. Just keep educating, collaborating because you don't have all the answers. And then figure out through that collaboration how you can be more innovative, more more inclusive, all of the stuff to, because it is I think you guys are onto something, and I think it's pretty incredible. Hey, are you active out there on uh, LinkedIn? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm going to have, you know, listeners, I'm going to have his link, his LinkedIn link. It's a, it's a hell of a stat card. His LinkedIn stat card's bristling with skills. That's what the, you. And he's got a hell of a beard, too. And then uh, we also it's have. Not quite, not quite as good as your skill, but. I have to agree with you. Mine is pretty <laughs> dazzling. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, and then, we, of course, we've got a, and this is interesting, listeners, we've got a giveaway here. Mastering the Performance Triad, the seven parts, optimization strategy for reliability, safety, and maintenance. It's a mouthful, but it's a free white paper, and I think you need to get it. So that's going to also be out there. Hopefully, I can get the, I'll talk to somebody in your organization to either get the, the paper or the link. Either or, go out to industrialtalk.com. You will find it. Get it. Because this is important stuff. Colin, you're pretty cool. I like it. Cool. like the conversation, my friend. I like my scotch. It's been very enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, listeners, you know, we're going to wrap it up on the other side. Everything that you want to know about Colin will be uh, recapped over there. So stay tuned. We will be right back. You're listening to the Industrial Talk Podcast Network. All right. I want to quickly thank Colin once again. Colin Duncan. Uh, with the SEAM Group, that's S-E-A-M-G-R-O-U-P. Uh, excellent conversation, spot on with all of the points. Loved it, loved it, geeked out big time. You can find Colin, of course. You can go out to LinkedIn. It's uh, The link is right here with this podcast. C. Duncan at SEAM Group is the email. Uh, you can go to their website at seamgroup.com, S-E-A-M-G-R-O-U-P. I'm telling you right now, you will not be disappointed. Again, I want you to be bold. I want you to be brave. And I want you to dare greatly. That's what is the responsibility of all industry professionals such as yourself. Because you want to be bold, brave, and daring greatly, you're hanging out with people who are bold, brave, and daring greatly. Because you are responsible for changing the world and leveraging the ability to educate and collaborate and innovate. That's what we're all about. All right, again, thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. We're going to have come back with a great interview shortly.